This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Hey, good evening. This is J.D. Webb, and you're listening to The Mead House. Uh, we've got a packed show here tonight, and uh, Michael Fairbrother from Moonlight Meadery has joined us. Uh, we're going to be talking to him about all kinds of things, uh, specifically how to make good meat at home. But Michael's been involved in making ciders, beers, braggots. Uh, braggot uh, seems to be our specialty for, the, uh, for this month, uh, along with sizer. So we'll be talking to him about that. Uh, listen to the show tonight. I hope you're, li- you're listening live. If you are, you're probably at themeathouse.com. If not, you can uh, head on over to the TuneIn Radio, tuneinradio.com. Pick up the mobile app over there and take us with you if you have to. Uh, we uh, have a Facebook. It's just simply The Mead House. Uh, time to time, we put stuff up over there, too. But uh, you really want to pay attention to the website. That's where all the news that uh, that happens here at the Mead House uh, kind of goes. So uh, Ryan Richardson in the house. Uh, Aaron Martin, Mississippi Chris Spencer along for the ride with Jeff Schaus. Jeff is our resident third world's best mead maker and beekeeper extraordinaire. Did I get that right, Jeff? Uh, close enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> close enough. <laughs> well, hey, uh, you know, to start out, we usually said to throw uh, throw a shout out uh, to a few folks out there that we run across uh, in all those different Facebook groups uh, and everything out there. Want to throw this one out, guys, to Brandon Cosmo Walters. He uh, just joined the mead or wine and mead making enthusiast group. Uh, he's got a picture over there of just carboy after it looks like my place. Just carboy after carboy after carboy of meads and wine says, uh, thanks for the ad. For some reason, my wife says I'm not allowed to start any more wine. Gosh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I'm not uh, sure he needs that kind of negativity in his life. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, uh, Brandon, uh, if you're listening to the show, uh, there's your shout out, my friend. And uh, I, got some, I got some ways on how to get around the wife. Uh, you need to give me a call. Um, you know, um, gosh, we got such a packed show. Why don't we just go ahead and bring Michael Fairbrother in? Michael, it's been a long time, my friend. Uh, last time you and I talked, it was over on the Got Mead live show. You had sent uh, us some mead, and we t- we tasted them, and uh, then jumped on the air. And of course, we were talking about them. And I hand down, still my most favorite one today, Michael, is Fling. Uh, that rhubarb, just unbelievably good. I really liked it. Welcome to the show, Michael. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, guys, I know we're all full of questions. Uh, and uh, I did write some down that uh, Ryan had a, had a pretty much a, a, a nice laundry list going here. I uh, kind of threw all that into my notes. But why don't, let's start out with the braggot uh uh, Michael, we've been working on braggots here recently, uh, and usually uh, once a month we'll we'll pick a style of mead, and you know we'll talk about some different aspects of it. Uh, you know, talk about some recipes, uh, and we've kind of each one of us have narrowed down to uh, a particular braggot that each of us are working on. It's not the same recipe. Uh, we're each doing different recipes. Um, but, uh, you know, braggots, much like beer, uh, and using beer yeast, beer ingredients, uh, what kind of advice would you give to each of us, uh, as far as working with a braggot? What's your best advice? So, yeah, so you don't have to use beer yeast. You could use, um, like the yeast I use to make my mead, which is Lavalin 71B. So I've done several commercial braggots 
thus far as collaborations. Um, I've done some with Heretic, Smog City, um, Urban Chestnut, you know, Stone Brewing Company, just to name a few, uh, in this continent and a couple down in Australia as well. So, you know, what I'm looking for when I'm trying to make a braggot is trying to make something, you know, A, enjoyable. So your honey's going to ferment fairly dry and it's going to have less body. So you want to probably adjust your mash temperature up a little bit just to give you a little more uh, residual sweetness from your malt. I tend to look for 15 to 20 percent of the fermentables to come from the honey. So you have, you know, something and you can pretty much do any style you've won. I've done IPAs, I've done milk stouts, I've done Russian imperial stouts, I've done, uh, you know, a couple of Russian imperial stouts. And, you know, Moonlight Meter is branching out into Hidden Moon Brewing Company. So we're going to start launching our commercial braggots fairly soon. So we're just looking for a contract brewer at this point. But, you know, as a home brewer, you really want to think about overall enjoyability and how to get that flavor to where you want to go. So you can use um, uh, homemade or beer yeast uh, to get to where you want to get to, but you can also use the wine yeast if that's where you want to go. So I, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, I thought, um, and maybe I'm missing something. Uh, maybe I missed something uh, along the, uh, the whole braggot line here, but I was under the impression that, the fermentables for a braggot had to be something in the neighborhood of 50%, no? Most homebrewers do it that way, and I've certainly made many homebrew recipes in excess of that, and I've actually done one uh, commercially that was 100% of the base fermentables was from um, honey, and all the, the adjuncts were from the, the specialty malts. Okay. So it's a, it's a pretty wide variety. Uh, commercially speaking, there's not a lot that will do over 50% um, honey fermentables, just because of the cost involved. But okay. as a you know, as an amateur, there's none of those restrictions applied to it. Good. I was I was really sweating this one out because <laughs> I, I, I you know my the whole uh, uh, all over the malt and and extract and a dry malt uh, that I had in mind equaled out to just a tad over eight pounds, and I only put uh, six and a half pounds of honey in, so I was all worried that, oh, my God, I didn't meet the braggot. Uh, <laughs> so I'm good to go. I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, Ryan, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I wanted to go off on that uh, yeast for a second, and uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for, for joining us. Um are there, you've talked about beer yeasts and wine yeast, you had mentioned 71B, you know, that you've used, um, you know, for, for us home, home mead makers and, and for all of our listeners, just one of my questions is, are there some specific strains or styles that tend to work better than others? And are there some strains or styles that you know, in your experience, you found don't work as well, you know, whether that, you know, ales or lagers or specific types of uh, of yeast um, that you've experienced. Well, so first and foremost, you're, you're trying to make a beer or a style of beer that replicates the base style that you're picking plus the, the addition or significant addition of honey. So you're trying to, if you know, declare for most competitions, hey, look, I'm trying to make a Belgian golden, and you know that's a base style, but it's a braggot. So what defines that? What what differentiates that from just a Belgian golden with a little bit of honey? The the major difference, in my opinion, is you're trying to create a beverage unlike a Belgian golden in this example but more like a Belgian golden than not. So you're trying to keep the characteristics of that, and you can do that with your malts and your hops. You want the characteristics of the flavor, but you, you're you trying to augment it and make it, in my opinion, better, right? And the vast majority of consumers, so, you know, for a home brewer, you can do anything you want. But as a commercial meadery owner and brewery owner, I'm trying to figure out how do I bridge those two gaps so that when somebody says, hey, you know, I've never heard of Braggot, 
what do I try? How do I taste this? What am I supposed to taste? When I declare it's going to taste like a Russian Imperial Stout, well, first and foremost, it's going to have that roastiness, the fullness of body, that 11.5% alcohol, you know, nice hops underneath, not in flavor, but in the bitterness to support all that and work in conjunction with the roastedness and the, the honey notes that may come from it. Now, as a home brewer, I made a 60 gallon, sorry, 20 gallon batch with a 60 gallon or 60 pounds of honey added to that 20 gallon batch. So the gravity was wow. off the charts, you know, 1.45 um, or 50 starting gravity. Would I recommend that to any of your, your listeners and fans? No, because <laughs> it took me <laughs> about six to seven years to get that to be drinkable. And I made it on a, a Belgian ale yeast, and then I put it onto a Flanders ale yeast and really made this kind of sour tart um, um, Russian Imperial Stout Braggot that I've served at the last, I don't know how many years, five National Home Brewers Conferences because it was something I thought that was really magical. And I wanted to share with a lot of fans. And we had a, a pretty big line this last year for the last of it, over 60 people deep, you know, most of the night long. And, you know, you can do things that nobody else has ever done before, period. And and as a home brewer and as a fan of fermented beverages, to me, that's why I do what I do. It's, you know, I want to I wanna push the envelope. I want to do a lot more than ever been done before, but as a, you know, commercial entity, I, I have to play within the rule book on, you know, okay, you're going to make a 16% alcohol beer. What are the restrictions around something like that? And in the state I live in, that's not allowed. So, but as a home brewer, you can make a 23% alcohol beer and knock your socks off. Prohibition still sneaking through every once in a while, isn't it? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just ignorance, I think, of uh, lawmakers and such, but yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I've, I've got a question. Now, when it comes to making mead, uh, especially with melomels, um, I can talk with you all day on an intelligent level. When it comes to beer brewing, uh, I've said before, I know virtually nothing. Um, so this is a real challenge for me to try to come up with a with a good recipe. I want to get your take on Braggett's uh, carbonation or still. What do you prefer? Does it depend on the style, or is it just personal preference? Well, most of the commercial Braggett's or homemade Braggett's I've tried have been carbonated. Usually you need that carbonation to support the base style. Um, if you were just to kind of, kind of go completely free range and try to think, well, how do you make a great beverage? You can certainly make a really good, um, malt based braggot, um, that is still and is exceptional. I mean, (laughs) so as an amateur, I've made both. Um, and you know, it, you, your challenge when you're trying to get through the, uh, you know, if you're making it for personal use, you know, personal consumption, nobody's your best critic but yourself. So if you make what you like, you're fine. If you're trying to enter into a BJCP category competition and trying to get the highest points, you, you can do so and enter it still. Um, I've I judged competitions in now three continents, and I can tell you usually the ones that are carbonated do a little better. But that doesn't mean they have to. A judge at the Mazer competition a few years in a row, also their best of show table, as long as I can remember. And you know, I can say that ones that are put together well, that represent the base style of beer, but also complement the honey notes, um, mm-hmm. tend to show off better. And carbonation mm-hmm. does help that. Yeah. So carbonation is more or less. Uh, something that people expect from the beer component and it just generally works better if it's there. Well, the carbonic acid will give you a um, little more depth to play with. So if you're trying to think about, you know, you've got acidity, you've got your malts, you've got your sweetness, and you've got your depth of uh, hops and, and roast notes, the carbonic note for carbonation gives you 
yet a third or fourth dimension that you get to play with. Okay. What, what, what about what about honey? Matching up honey. Uh, you know, I mean, I've always heard that the you know lighter flavored orange blossom, clover for lighter fruits, peach, that kind of thing, and uh, you know, the more darker, uh, sometimes the more wilder wildflower, a little more depth of flavor for the darker fruits, that kind of thing. Is there a, I mean, is uh, there a hogwash, preference? It? <laughs> it's complete hogwash. hogwash. So you want to think about, <laughs> okay. yeah, you want to, you want to think about your flavors and how they interact. Like, um, Smog City yeah. and I, we did a, um, Russian Imperial Stout with a meadow foam honey. Well, meadow foam's got this really nice toasted marshmallow note. So we were thinking about this flavor as how do we make almost like a um, like a s'mores type of flavor, right? How do you get that rich, roasty, toasty malt and the marshmallow notes together, and what yeah. is that going to come out like? But I've also done, like with stone, we used, um, uh, shoot, I can't even remember the honey. Uh, oh, my buddies on stone are going to kill me. But it was a... Um, Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> it was it was a uh, medium dark honey, and we did a milk stout, and um, you know we got the sweetness from the lactose that we added to the batch versus from the honey. So you know people think honey is going to give you this residual sweetness, and that can depending on how much you use. But honey is really fermentable; it can go down below you know one, and it'll give you that really rich dry note. And I've taught twice at the um, or pre- sorry, correctly stated, I presented twice at the National Honey Board's beer conference where they've uh, flown me out twice to talk to professional brewers to tell them how to make braggots with, with, with honey. And usually what we're trying to do is talk to them about, you know, honey can ferment dry. So how to get that residual, you know, body left and sweetness to match up with the honey flavor that you have. So most consumers don't know what honey tastes like when it's not sweet. So they expect it to taste sweet. And so when they taste it and it's not sweet, they're like, well, what's this flavor? And you can do that by altering your mash temperature so you get that residual sweetness left from the unfermentable sugars that you're getting from your mash. And that really can pair up with your honey. So whether it's a light honey like a, um, um, you know, um, uh, orange blossom or something a little more darker, uh, or even something, you know, jet black, like uh, uh, African wild blossom honey that has this really rich malty note to it. You know, all that can work. I mean, I certainly wouldn't try to make a, like an IPA with an African wild organic blossom honey, but, you know, I might tend to think about, you know, an orange blossom honey or a lychee honey with something that's a little lighter. And, you know, if I was going to make a milk style like the guys I did with in at Stone, I used avocado honey, which had a really nice nutty flavor that really kind of paired up with a uh, roasting malt notes from the, the malt. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I'm going to have to listen to this show a couple of times and I'm trying to take notes while he's talking. I, I gave up. <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm uh, hearing him say, what if, if I'm coming away with this properly, uh, it's, it's no different than any other mead. You're, you're looking at, at your ingredients and you're thinking, you know, what does this pair up with? Uh, if you were making a cherry melomel, then you're going to look for a honey with that, uh, something that you know pairs well with the flavor of cherries. So, um, yeah, the best way I'd describe it to customer your consumers is simply this, which is I think of the totality of the beverage first and foremost. And that's why when I lectured the BJCP um, panel or uh, what was it called, the, the, the gathering at the National Homebrewers Conference a few years back, I said, you cannot think mead has to taste like honey. Yeah. That's like trying to think that if you make sausages, you want it to taste like, you know, Jimmy Dean, down, whatever it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want the totality of the flavor, not the particular ingredients that go into the flavor. And, you know, it's a mistake that mead makers can make when they try to say, okay, it's got to taste like honey, when you add raw honey and after the fact that I fermented and it's, and, and the best way I can describe that to people is like when my mother made meatloaf when I was a kid, the ketchup cooked on top of the meatloaf did not taste anything like the ketchup squirted on the side of the plate afterward. I mean, you, you want that totality of flavor 
and that's why, like, the fruit that I make in my meads and the spices and all the honey that I add, you know, I add them at particular times to get the, the right characteristics, but I don't want it to taste like raw fruit. I don't want it to taste like raw honey, and I don't want it to taste vegetal. I don't want to taste peppers in my mead, you know, in the fact that it's green and, you know, this herbal um, peppery note to it. So I tried to figure out how do I add the, that ingredient at that time frame to get the flavor that I want, and how do I manage that? So that's why, you know, we make over 80 types of mead. We're coming out with six different types of braggots. You know, we're, we're really trying to look at, you know, again, totality of flavor experience, whether it's our Russian Imperial braggot, whether it's our, you know, kettle soured um, lambic style braggot, whether it's the, you know, um, yeah, IPA style braggot, you know, all these kind of things that we're cooking up. And I'm brewing them here at home to make sure I get the recipes dialed in before I actually go off and commercially contract these to come out to the marketplace. But, you know, I want you to be able to go into the store and say, you know what? I want to taste the world's best braggots, and who's better than that than Moonlight Meadery or Hidden Moon Brewing Company and, and see and buy my product. Yeah. Ryan, you have technical questions here. Yeah. It is. Uh, so when I've uh, made beer this is on kind of aerating and degassing when i've made beer you know i've uh, made sure the the uh, wort was was uh aerated a little bit but then you know you pitch the yeast put it on airlock put the airlock on and and you know just let it sit you know while it ferments um when we make mead you know we, we're typically stirring it you know the first the first few days to a week you know, regularly making sure that the yeast are getting plenty of oxygen and moving around and that kind of thing. Um, and again, I'm talking on the home brew scale, you know, for the home home mead maker. What is the approach for braggots that you found in terms of is, do, you, do you treat it more like a beer or more, you know, where you're letting it just sit? Or should you treat it more like a mead where we're, um, you know, we're giving it stirs, uh, you know, the first few days? Sure. So and I not, and I would add. You want to make I, would, uh, I would add to that question also the nutrient schedule that goes right along yeah. with the aerating and degassing. So do not ever make a braggot like you're going to make a meat. The malt will oxidize and it will taste like cardboard and it'll taste horrible. So you you want to treat a braggot like it's a beer in fermentation technique. So you want to keep oxygen away from it after you've pitched the yeast and let it go. You can certainly add nutrients. I've done several commercial braggots where we've done that, and um, that works fine. So it's kind of a combination, right? So what you're trying to accomplish is how do you give your yeast enough nutrients? Now, malt has more nitrogen, your yeast-assumable nitrogen, than your honey would have. So you, you don't have to add more nitrogen. What you could do is calculate how much nitrogen you might need based on the amount of honey you're adding to it. So if we're doing what JD was suggested, a 50% base malt, uh, 50% honey fermentables, you know, what, what do you need to do to um, get to the level of yam that you need to ferment? You know, it's a complicated process, but you talk to um, the folks at Scott Labs to kind of figure out where you're at, and you can figure out, how much, sorry, I'm just drinking a little bit of my mead. Um, you, you could figure out how much um, nutrients you might need to add. Uh, typically, I would look at what about half um, of what you might t- normally need with uh, like the um, tailored organic uh, uh, nutrient regime that um, Sergio from Melovino has posted on his website because um, you've got the nitrogen content coming in from the, the malt. But I would certainly not stir it or degas it or add any kind of um, extra notes to it. Now, another technique that your home brewers could think about is make a really good base beer, make a really good base mead, and then blend the two of them after post-fermentation. Now, commercial wineries or breweries in the United States can't make them that way, but you can certainly make a phenomenal braggot based on blending after post-fermentation. So you can make your base beer perfectly like you make your normal beers, make your meads just like you might normally make it with all the nutrients and degassing, and, and, and then blend to your heart's content to get the flavor you want. 
and so that into a competition, I guarantee you, if you've got a good sense of taste and smell, you're probably going to place a medal. Mm. Now that that answers a lot of questions for me as well, because uh, you know I'm I'm one of these people who uh, I tend to overthink things, and and when I get into looking at a particular style, uh, I sort of get I corner myself into. Um, a way of thinking, and I guess I need to stop doing that and start uh, being willing to experiment more. Um, but it always appeared to me that uh, to make a braggot, you know, you uh, you ferment everything together, uh, sort of like a melomel. I would never make a base mead and then make a wine and then blend them together and call them a melomel. But I guess in reality, there's really nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so technically, I could brew a mead here in the United States, ship it to Canada, blend it with a brewery's product in Canada, turn around and import that back into the United States, and that would be perfectly legal. But I am prohibited from doing such in the United States. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a whole uh, other show. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't, that, that, that's the whole... I mean, we touched on some of that over at Got Mead when I was producing the show over there about some of the legalities and everything centered around meaderies. It's a very young industry. The federal government has no clue what to do with it. Uh, almost treated it like it was a bastard child from another planet. Uh, you know, you know, talking to these guys like Sergio and, and Michael Fairbrother, Michael Fall, even. But like like Ryan said, that that's a whole other show. Um, Michael, the first braggot that I ever tasted uh, was sent to me by uh, Aaron Martin, one of our co-hosts here tonight. And, uh, man, I love the stuff. And uh, I think that's really the style of me that that I really enjoy the most uh, because I like the beer quality about it. Um, and as Aaron knows, the, the only problem that I really had with it was it just just a little bit more hops and not quite as sweet, uh, and it's almost there. I mean, it was and it was absolutely wonderful. How do you control the hop levels? Uh, are you are you go are you using a like a beer? Uh, I don't know what do they call it? These uh, you know sites that you can go to and put beer recipes together with. You know, like the calculators. Yeah, IB IBUs. Yeah, yeah I mean, how, certainly how you... um, from a homebrew perspective, certainly your best approach. Um, it, when you get to um, working with professional breweries or there are brewers who have done this for a long time, it tends to get get a little more instinctive. And you're thinking about, you know, you know, I was really fortunate enough to know Mitch Steele and work with him as a homebrewer, and then. You know, we've commercially done a bracket together. And, you know, when they suggested the hopping profile, I said, perfect. <laughs> what do I know that can add to somebody with that kind of uh, experience? Nothing is what I have to say. So, you know, it's it's all about, you know, how do you get a, a beverage that kind of meet what your expectations are? And so for uh, for this particular batch, we were making a um, – a braggot that had a lot of residual sugar, you know, like a, a chocolate stout or a milk stout would have. You know, we're looking at, you know, what would the avocado honey add to it and how would that work. And, you know, Chris Ketchum, Mitch Steele, and I kind of bounced this recipe off each other many times. But, you know, I leaned on them for the beer side. They leaned on me for the honey side of the, the conversation. And, you know, I got to taste the result. Phenomenal. You know, so I really kind of, you know, look when I'm judging to see what's the totality of the beverage. Are the hops in conjunction with the malt and honey profile? Is it, you know, if you're making an IPA like the IPA I did with uh, um, Heretic Brewing Company with Jamil, you know, we were looking for a pretty hop forward note to it. And we came up with a pretty cool name called Evil Bee. And, you know, they, they've they made this beer braggot uh, several times now since I've gone out and done the collaboration with them. So, you know, it's kind of like how can you think about the honey? You know, here we used orange blossom. You know, how do the hops, you know, citrus, citra, et cetera, work with that? 
And how does that give you that flavor you're looking for? Yeah. I know. So, again, uh, uh, when I, when I okay. made my first beer, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into this tasting. I taste the honey. I taste the ingredients that are going into my meads. And, and so I'm making this beer and uh, hops. Okay, what, what do hops taste like? So nonchalantly, I just popped one of those little pellets into my mouth, and I swear, that's the most foul-tasting thing I have <laughs> ever ingested. And I can't imagine putting this in my beer. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, so I, I, I've got a, a sort of a technical question here concerning the hops. Um, uh, Ken Shram had passed along a recipe to me uh, for a um, uh, an ale braggot. And the first thing I noticed was that it had an excessive amount of hops in it, way too many hops for that particular style of beer. But once I plugged it into the calculator and I added in the honey, uh, all of a sudden those IBUs came way down, uh, well within range for that particular style. So uh, is that something that you that people need to take into account when they're sort of in the planning stages that they need to make, um, make, uh, take into account how the, the addition of the honey is going to affect all that. Um, well, I haven't had that experience myself, but I'm not trying to cast out on what Ken shared with you. So, you know, Ken's an accomplished, you know, worldwide accomplished mead maker. And, you know, I certainly respect his input and guidance on many things. Um, I can't say I have that experience, so I tend to look at the base style of the recipe, calculate that recipe out for the sweetness that you're coming out to. I tend to look at the honey contribution as flavor and alcohol, uh, no residual sweetness usually after fermentation. Um, now, you could certainly make a braggot where you have lots of residual sweetness left from fermentation. You know, that braggot I made with 60 pounds of honey in a 20-gallon batch, you know, was <laughs> was sweeter than sweet. You know, it had um, probably 20, 15 uh, Play-Doh left, so that would be a 1.06 1. 1. sweetness left. So, you know, truckloads of sweetness. But then when I added the, the lambic yeast to it, it, it eventually brought it down, which gave me, you know, 17, 18% alcohol mead. But it, you know, it took, you know, several years to get there. Commercially, I can't make one of those. <laughs> I don't have seven years to, to put that, you know, much money into a batch. And, well, most people wouldn't want to pay for it um, to get to where I want to get to. Yeah. So I'm not trying you know, to say Ken was wrong, but I think that it depends. And without knowing the details of the recipe, the residual sugar, um, any of these other effects, you know, it, you could go either way. And Chris, well, I'm, just I'm a, thinking, a, go, go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no problem. I, I was just going to say I, I experienced a similar phenomenon with my Braggot recipe, actually, where um, what – the, the recipe I had crafted was like a black IPA style, which is extremely heavy on the hops. Um, I actually don't have the recipe in front of me, but I, I remember that was one of the things that really jumped out at me about the recipe was just how excessively hopped this thing was. And what was interesting to me um, was when I was plugging this thing into the IBU calculator with looking at some of the different factors of like batch size and the, the starting gravity and then the amount of hops – it came out to a much lower IBU level than what just the the beer kit itself was without the the extra honey added to it. So I, I just I I wonder if there is something to that as like the the final sweetness level of the beverage increases, does the IBU level also decrease if you know if the hop level remains constant? Well, maybe it's well, I would, hop uh, level that decreases. So. You know, maybe it's a more of an accent. So I've tried meads that were hopped, ciders that were hopped. So I think that the residual sweetness, maybe it's like how I describe acidity and sweetness as two to separate dials. Maybe that hopping level is a third dial on that. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking maybe the alcohol, the the extra alcohol from the from the honey was providing some sort of dilution. But now that's there again. That's just my very uh, amateur way of looking at it. So uh, it, I wish I understood more about beer brewing before I got into this because now it's driving me nuts. <laughs> so. Hey, Michael. I, uh, I was wondering if I could a- ask a question kind of on a tangent of what you were talking about before. When you're putting together a braggot recipe, about how long are you planning to age it before it, it goes out or it gets you know tasted or you're ready to call it done? Uh, that's a really good question. So most of the, the braggots I've made commercially have all been made at somebody else's brewery. So sure. it's really dependent on how they make their products and what kind of time frame they're required to kind of hit to make their numbers. One bracket I made was probably two months, three months time frame. We got another one coming out by Smog City that's probably been over a year. It's been aged in barrels and well, it's over a year, probably a year and a half at this point. Um, those are probably the outliers of, you know, from short to top long. I okay. haven't followed up with the guys in Australia to see how those have gone from the ones I made this spring where we did 100% of the base fermentables from honey. Um, I'm interested to try these. I just haven't had a chance to um, connect with them to see how it's gone along. Um, I have talked to some guys down in Santiago about um, coming back down to do a bracket with them. You know, I like playing. Sure. And I tend to look at it as how can I how can I do something nobody's done before and how can I tie these flavors together? And, you know, we've got our utopian mead, which is five years in a barrel. I could see doing a Russian Imperial stout in a, in a barrel, like a bourbon barrel for five years. Um, so I think the world's ready for that. Not today, but maybe in five years it might be. So, you know, it's kind of a, how much am I willing to put a bet on that? Um, but most of the breweries have to turn over their tanks pretty quickly. And even when we're looking to contract brew, you know, having somebody shut down their kettle for 24 hours, the kettle sour, you know, you're asking a lot. You know, that price goes up pretty high because um, sure. they're trying to make profit, and they make profit by how fast can they turn the product over. So, you know, for me to say, okay, can you shut down your brew house for 24 hours just for me, you know, <laughs> and have a compelling uh, statement behind why I'm going to make that work for them. <laughs> so, in general, yeah. would you say that braggots generally need more time than mead to age? Uh, and and when I say that, it, uh, remember that uh, with our techniques that we've been talking about, with good aeration, degassing, nutrients, temperature control. Uh, you know, we're turning out meads that are perfectly drinkable at three months. So, uh, how, how do how do home brewed braggots compare to that, in your opinion? So you can make a, a really perfectly good mead if you're doing everything right in about three weeks. So you can shave off that three months. The the challenge you have with the time frame, at least commercially, for mead versus, you know. Um, homemade mead is how can you clarify it without spending a million dollars to do so and how do you get that flavor you want so you know folks like Mike Fall and you know Sergio and you know Ken they're able to make meads in two weeks yeah I personally two can't weeks. say I've done that yeah <laughs> I can't say I've done that at this point I've gotten the fermentation done in two or three weeks but, you know, it's not really ready to drink at that point in time. Now, I'm putting pretty serious investment in my company. We're buying a cross-flow filtration system so that we can filter from that really hazy colloidal material level like apple cider down to apple juice in one day without the added cost of all the uh, filtration systems. But I'm putting $90,000 of my money on the table to make this happen. So. Yeah, I can't tell you how to do it today. Call me back in a couple of months when I get my filter in to see if I can make that happen. But, you know, three-month time frame for beer or for mead is pretty phenomenal. And if you can make mead in three weeks, that's even more phenomenal if it tasted. But 
you know, my commitment is never to sell product that doesn't taste phenomenal. <laughs> so, Michael, mm-hmm. just if I can jump in and, and ask yeah. a question kind of along the, these lines, and this is kind of a general question that, that may even even be different from different beer style to beer style, but from your observation, what happens to a braggot as, as you age it over time? You know, I, I think with, with mead, a lot of times people have this perception that when a, a mead is young, it, the tendency is to have more of those harsh, uh, you know, flavors from, from the, the alcohol. And over time that mellows, I'm not sure that I've really noticed that quite as much in the couple of braggots that I've done. So, so from your observation, what, what do you notice happens to a braggot over time? So the, it's a very similar um, aspect for me. So the longer it can be aged, the better. So the, the, the braggot that Smog City brewed with us, you know, or brewed with me a year and a half ago, it, it, I can't wait to try it. To be honest, I really can't wait to try it. It's gonna. It's been aged in bourbon barrels. It had metal foam honey, so you're gonna have marshmallow notes to it. It's got the raw, roasty malt note. The the malt was so full in the uh, fermenter, it was coming over the top of the mash tun. I mean, this 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 thing is a monster, and you know, there's very little of it available. And I can't wait to try something that's been aged that long. The, the the experience I've had, and I got to crack open a mead that we had. Um, one of my one of my importer from Australia, Daniel Rickard, gave me um, that was forty years old, and I got to crack that open at my house two, three nights ago. Fucking forty year old mead, guys! Come on, <laughs> and I had a bottle sitting <laughs> in my basement. You know, the flavor was just beyond exceptional. I mean. The cork broke in two, one piece went into the bottle, and one piece came out, and we're like, oh, boy, this is going to suck. And then we poured it out, and it was this dark brown liquid that was crystal clear, and it was, you know, I had Scott Char, who's a pretty worldwide renowned home mead maker here at the house. You know, we did a, a collaboration at the meadery, enjoying this with my son, my wife, and my stepson and I. And, you know, my stepson's not the biggest fan of me. You know, he's, he's getting into it. He's learning. But, you know, my my son and my wife have been drinking this stuff for a long time. And so here we are sharing this bit beverage that is 40 years old. And, you know, I was 10 when it was made. And it was just mind-blowing. I can't wait for the day somebody puts together a bracket that ages it for 40 years and, you know, I'd be 90. So it ain't going to be me. <laughs> but, yeah. you know... <laughs> Uh, you know, I would love to see this happen because what happens with honey, so honey's a really nice antioxidant. So it really has this uh, capacity to age in barrels or age in um, containers and, and really change in a positive way where a beer, and that's why I'm trying to tell you, don't beat oxygen into a braggot because the malt will oxidize and you'll have a flavor that reminds you more of cardboard than of a braggot. But get that finished fermentation and get it aging in something as magical as oak, and it's going to just turn into just pure delight. I mean, pure delight. Think of something that's 11% alcohol with honey, antioxidants to help protect it, the malt, you know, maybe not super hoppy, but just, you know, rich. So if you were going to, if I was really going to lay one down, I'd probably do a, a barley wine style, English style barley wine, or a Russian imperial stout, or like a Baltic porter, or maybe, you know, something as crazy as a Belgian golden. And let that age, and let that, that, that malt and honey kind of really intermix in the flavors, um, really soften. You know, the key point that I would mention is ferment at about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, keep that low and slow so you get that nice, clean flavor, not that alcohol bite, and you're going to have something just exceptional. So I must be on the right track with my my recipe selection for my braggot. Uh, I used a bourbon barrel stout recipe, beer recipe. It came in a kit, um, you know, not knowing any place else to start, and all I did was add honey to it. Um I went on a bourbon buying frenzy, and my wife and I came home with, I don't know, we got like 
uh, six or seven different kinds of bourbon now, made my selection. Uh, right now it's sitting in, in the carboy with the bourbon added and the oak cube. So you're saying basically I, I can just I, sh- I should just let that sit for as long as I can stand to let it sit, right? I would let it sit longer than you could possibly let it sit. That might be hard. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Well, that, I mean, that, this is really good to know because I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking like Ryan was asking uh, about the aerating. You know, I mean, uh, okay. So are we looking at beer, or are we looking at mead techniques, or what? And you know, typically with beer, I mean, it's in a carboy. Uh, you know, for a month, and then it's in a keg or in the bottle. You know, um, and Michael, this is this is exactly the kind of information that I needed because I would have treated it like mead, and I would have ruined it because I would have been aerating it and degassing it uh, every day. Uh, now, let me ask you a, a something related to that. Uh, I know that most beer brewers, uh, when they finish their boil and they're getting ready to pitch their yeast, they will somehow aerate the wort uh, before they pitch the yeast. So I assume that that applies here. Like uh, if I wanted to use my drill-mounted mixer to uh, to make sure the honey was dissolved and beat some oxygen into it, that would be okay uh, before we'll I start. pitch the yeast. Yeah, so typically what, what I recommend and work with many commercial brewers on is adding honey at knockout. So you don't want to cook your honey. But you want to add it in. So breweries are really concerned about, you know, wild fermentation and losing a batch. So, you know, at less than 14% alcohol, that's, that's a really viable concern, right, which is how do I not infect this thing? So, you know, pitching, you know, honey, which has all sorts of potential microbes in it, you know, how do I get that to be clean? So they typically add honey after knockout in their world. You know, at that point, once the whirlpool is done, they're going to uh, inject oxygen in line into the wort steam before it gets into the fermenter. So they're, you know, oxygenating it that way. That is perfectly fine for making a, a braggot, and um, I highly recommend it. And you'll probably find many people to disagree with what I'm saying to you guys tonight, which is this is the art form of it. You know, what works for me may not work for everybody. But it's it's how I make the meads and braggots that I make. So this is why, you know, I can paint or create the flavors I create because it's what works for me. So if, you know, there's more scientific approaches, you know, I'm welcome to listen. But, you know, I've tried meads that have been made at, you know, professional wine schools, and they were (laughs) god-awful. And they listened to the advice of the mead makers, and they got a lot better. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I do everything I've been doing based on intuition, based on what I've learned and based on how I've learned to brew and how I've learned to make bead. So it's it's kind of, um, you know, i got 20 years experience doing this stuff at this point. This is, you know, this is like I described to people how I breathe. So, you know, it, it works for me. So this is the, the key piece for me. Well, you know, a lot of people disagree with me about starting my black currant melomel at eleven sixty two and ending <laughs> it at, at ten fifty eight. But when they taste it, they change their mind. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I, I've had yeah. uh, I've had probably two dozen people tell me that there's no way you can start fermenting a beverage at eleven sixty two, and I said, well, it's a funny thing because I've made about forty gallons of it and <laughs> had no problem. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we started our black turn and apple meat at fifty bricks, which is one point two zero? Two two zero zero? <laughs> you know, so fifty percent sugar is, is is pretty fucking phenomenally high. You know, yeah. and yeah. it takes a lot of guidance and a lot of patience and you know, knowing what you're doing to make it work. <laughs> my my refractometer <clears throat> doesn't even go that high. I know. <laughs> uh, no, the refractometer goes doesn't go that high. The the um, hydrometer pops off the top of the <laughs> of the <laughs> hydrometer tube. Yeah, it's it's something crazy, but well, that yeah. you know that's another area that uh, we've also gotten into here 
you know, here on the show the last month or so, we've been talking about sizers, Michael, and and ciders, um, and uh, you know, trying to get that apple flavor. Now, no, knowing that, you know, you're just not going to find any cider apples here in the United States. Going to be, you know, probably very expensive. If you can find them at all, so we're we're relegated at not, to at least not for us on the homebrew level. Yeah, maybe, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're oh, we're relegated we're relegated to using apple juice from the store or fresh pressed, God only knows what's in it, apple juice from an orchard. Um, how do you how do you treat how do you treat making a cider or a sizer from uh, this store-bought apple juice. What, what can we do oh. Oh. to make it come out uh, more like a traditional cider or sizer? So I well, I live in New Hampshire. We got uh, apple orchards, two or three of them, within a couple miles of the meadery. So I'm surrounded by apple orchards. Oh man! Most of them grow Cortlands, uh, Macintosh, Red Delicious, uh, Galas, Table. Mm, you might. Yeah, more, mostly table apples, um, but you can really get great flavors with them. So here's how. We typically use volume percentage-wise, 25% volume honey, 75% volume cider. That's going to give you a really, really sweet base to work from. Typically, you'll be looking at about almost 17% alcohol. Um, percentage that you can create from that. Run, run those numbers by us again. You said 25%? 25% by volume, honey. 75% by volume cider. The cider may come in at about 13 bricks, and you're going to get, you know, um, calculate your numbers, but you've, you've got something that's going to come in at 1.048, oh, so uh, starting gravity-wise. So you know, bricks is 17% um, fermentable, so it'd be 34% um, uh, starting gravity. So 34 and higher. So if you want to bone dry, start at 1.034 and want some sweetness left to it, go higher than that. And what I've seen, and I've won the national or international meat uh, Mazer Cup for sizes two years in a row. So last apple took a gold one year, and Virtue took a gold, I think, this year. So both are barrel age sizes, so apple and honey, just age in a barrel. One was a, a used utopian barrel, so, okay, call that a ace and hole, but, yeah, one was a, <laughs> a Jim Bean bourbon barrel, which was, you know, just recently acquired. You get the bourbon hint to it. So, you know, both are 16% alcohol and above, you know, finished. And, you know, both have a, a pretty good residual sweetness to them. But, you know, the key the key is your temperature of fermentation. So if you can ferment low enough, like in the mid to low 60s, you get all the flavors you want without the burn of the alcohol. Most commercial meaderies and home brewers do not realize that you can lower the temperature, to sl- you know, make it slow enough, and you get the smooth flavor you want. Now, we pitch about two grams per gallon yeast. We use the, the nutrient regime of 24, 48, and 72 hours, and the last one at 30% completion or seven days. And, you know, so you can get the fermentation done. It's still in the two-week time frame. Then we put it into the barrels and let it mature for a year or more. So you get that nice, sweet apple, the hint of the, the bourbon out of the barrel, so you get coconut, vanilla, you know, a little whiskey note from the side, and it's goddamn magic. I mean, it really is magic. But I've loved this style for 20 years. So, you know, for 20-plus years, I've made ciders and sizers and, you know, combinations thereof. I mean, we're starting to can our cider. This this coming Friday will be our first run. 800 cases being made, and it's all pre-sold already. Oh, man. So, <laughs> wow. So this is all made like from that. dessert. From dessert apples, the like right. you were so saying, we don't the even have, and, yeah, we don't even have access to the what quote unquote cider apples like Pippins, um, uh, Blackstones, and all the rest of them. 
because you know the big you know cider producers you know grow their own apples and don't let anybody else have access to them until I can get my own orchard to to grow the apples I want. I have to work with the blends that I can get, but I can I can quantitatively tell you that I can blend you know apples that are commercially available. And we buy cider right now at about three to four thousand gallons a pop. You know, in three months we'll be getting cider in six thousand gallon lots at a pop because we've got hundred barrel fermenters coming in. And no particular no particular amount of one apple or another to whatever the cidery, whatever the apple orchard is producing at the time, right? Well, so whatever, I, whatever they're crushing um, and grinding. So I buy a lot of cider from one particular farm or presser, and he will get me any blend of apples that I specify. But I've really kind of relied on what's considered a New England apple cider blend, which is a good mix of the dessert apples, a little bit of tannins from, from other apples, and looking at that totality of flavor. Now, if a cider presser tells you here's his fall blend that he likes to make barrel-aged cider, Pay the fuck attention. I mean, this guy is telling you what his family has used for generations to make cider. That's what I've been following. Uh, you know, I don't and want I, to. And I also, go ahead. I don't want to pretend that I know more than these guys at all, because when I tried, you know, Paul Corinthi wrote the I don't remember the bike book offhand, but like the New England cider book you know, twenty years ago when I was first starting. You know, Paul used to run these cider presses at the local farms here in New England. And I'd go in and, you know, pick up a couple gallons of cider and bring it home. And I tried some with bread yeast and some with wild yeast and some with beer yeast and such. Yeah, I got my variations that I liked and didn't like. But, you know, when I started dialing into one particular yeast, figuring out what that yeast liked and didn't like and how to manage that, I was able to create ciders that won me awards, you know, way back from 1996. You know, so uh, 1996, I was one year into homebrewing, and I'm winning awards with the ciders that I was making. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't so I, I want to say two things here. First of all, these guys, uh, especially J.D., was poking fun at me last week for saying uh, a harping <laughs> on temperature control, and bam, did he not what? just say low 60s is what I've been saying and preaching for <laughs> <laughs> all this time. So, well, that's uh, that's kind of the moniker of the whole show. I mean, we started that from the beginning. I mean, load slow, been, baby. Uh, yes, I've been I've been preaching that forever. Yeah. Second thing, uh, Michael, is basically what you're saying is, if we find a good apple juice that we like, we we're we're not at a disadvantage when it comes to making good cider and sizer uh, by by using store bought apple juice. Or right, and that's the same thing apples. about the water when you make a mead. Right, so people tell me, well, how do you treat your water? I'm like, I don't. I, I, I use the water I drink every day, which tastes phenomenal to me. So, you know, the, the, the key is it's got to taste good. If it can taste good, and you've got quality apple juice, you know, it's not chock full of sorbate and sulfites and everything else, go for it. You know, we, we order our cider pressed the day it's pressed to be delivered to the meadery. And at that point in time, you know, it's pretty wild. Like, we we normally blend it with some sugar to make our ciders, you know, 13.5% alcohol. Or our mead, we blend it with honey to 14 16%. So it's pretty strong. I took some in without blending it, and I made it, and I got this wild yeast culture going. And I had flacco, butternices, you know, all on the top, big pellicle. So what I learned from that, I got wild cider coming in the door. I have to make it strong and pitch a ton of yeast to get what I want. If I don't, I lose the race and I get something wild. My wild cider, we're going to probably start canning in about six weeks. It's going to be called Them Sour Apples. Wait do you guys try this thing. It tastes like a Normandy-style cider. It's got the rich apple note to it with a little tan and a little horse blanket in the back. Oh, my God, I want some. It is. It is dry. It is tasty as anything. Well, you're going to have to get us some, Michael, oh, because you God. can't let Sergio out. You know, Sergio sent us all about five <laughs> bottles, and you, 
<laughs> you can't let him outdo you like that. You're going to yeah. have to step up. You only let me know yesterday that you wanted me on the phone call tonight. So please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a post interview tasting whenever they whenever those bottles get here. Um, yeah, we we can have you back on for a tasting. But so uh, you know this this basic premise uh, it seems to me applies across the board. You, uh, good ingredients in, good ingredients out. So if they taste good. Use them, and the same goes with your your apple juice. Uh, That's what Ryan you was like saying. Uh, yeah, Ryan was saying, telling us that on the last show. I mean, you know, crap in, crap out. That's kind of his deal too. So I agree with that. You can never make anything with cheap ingredients. I mean, think of Ben and Jerry's, right? They make the world's some of the world's best ice cream by using the best ingredients possible. I spend up to fifty dollars a pound for vanilla beans. Because I'm buying the best vanilla beans I can. You know, we use Vietnamese cinnamon, which is actually from a cinnamon tree, uh, yeah. for our Kurtz apple pie. I just was enjoying a pint of this I have on draft here at the house. You know, 14% alcohol to 16%, you know, apple, honey, cinnamon, and vanilla, period. Nothing else added, and it's my best seller. Yeah. Uh, what about your yeast selection for ciders and uh, and sizers? You still go with seventy one B for those as well. I use seventy one B for everything I make. All the braggots will be made with seventy one B. All the sizers and melomels and methylgorns are all made with the same. He's, yeast. he's keeping Lalvin in business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I buy a lot of their yeast, <laughs> and we don't usually um, we grow it. We did make a. Um, 20 liter batch of a uh, Manuka honey mead this week. Um, and we oh have a, a 500 gram packet of yeast that we used for split between that and the 80 gallon batch of a pineapple um, mesquite mead. So I've got a really healthy starter at this point that I plan to use to make um, some of our cider coming up in the next few weeks. Manuka honey? What did you yeah, pay for that? Australia. I- yeah, I have. You know, I saw that on the shelf at Whole Foods Market, and I, I mean, it's like nine dollars for like a half an ounce jar of this stuff. And I brought it home, and I thought, oh, this ought to taste pretty good. And I tasted it, and my God, it tasted. It's just foul. It's just foul. So am I not? Tell me well, about manuka I honey. <laughs> so the manuka honey I got, I picked up the spring in. Um, um, Australia. Um, so it's, I, I met the beekeeper and it's not foul at all. So it's almost, um, it's jelly like. So it's a little thicker, uh, a little crystallized, almost looks like specks of cinnamon in it. Um, it's that's just, not what uh, this looked like. Yeah. Okay. So I need to keep looking. Yeah. I could point you at my friend John, who owns this, uh, uh, apiary and, in um, Australia to help you get some real stuff. But so basically I got it right from the guy that pollinates these trees. Okay. All right. I want to jump back to brag it for a second. Yeah. You know, I I once heard a guy say that he, uh, he was never going to make a watermelon mead because he couldn't picture it. Uh, You know, that that was, yeah. (laughs) With that being said, is there are there any beer styles that you just can't see uh, working well as braggots? I'm not going to make a goza mead braggot. I don't like the salt. I don't like the flavor. Um, I could see a Russian Imperial Porter, Baltic Porter, IPA, um, Kolsch. Most styles would work for me, but, you know, I'm not a fan of goes, so that's probably not going to be one of my top uh, top tries anytime soon. Yeah. Now, well, is, Mike, that, is that related to a lambic in some way, a goes? No, uh, it's a salt beer. It's from Germany. Oh, okay. Michael, we've had you here for about 45 minutes or so, my friend. Uh and we don't do any commercials here. It's just, just a straight-up five guys sitting around the table just yakking about mead. Uh, if you're good to go for about another 15 minutes or so, we'd love to keep you around. But uh, if you need to go, uh, make sure you let us know. Um, 
back to the cider thing again, okay? Uh, you know, a lot of people like me are pretty much relegated to what's available in the store. So it's going to be Mott's or Treetop for me uh, for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, is there anything... Um, Anything I should be looking for or anything? Could I follow the same advice that you just gave uh, with the 75, 25, uh, you know, what you've just told us about making cider using the same store-bought apple juice such as Mott's or Treetop? Yeah, I'd try to find a, a Whole Foods or somewhere where you might be able to find some organic um, cider. Um okay. Fresh I can't press say I've is, tried to make, yeah, for, well, it's probably not going to be fresh pressed, but your best yeah. bet is, uh, you know, an apple orchard that can press it for you. I mean, I can order my cider, you know, UV treated, sulfided, all this kind of stuff, temperature, heat, flash, pasteurized, and all that. I get it fresh. So the way they press the apple, the best bet. You want to have the best one, get yourself an apple press. Get yourself some apples. It takes about six bushels per gallon to get apples into juice. So when you think about cider at three dollars a gallon, that's a pretty good price. <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> more out how here. Much apples, you know, go up for. Um, yeah. The other thing you could try to do is try to find and buy frozen apple juice or juice concentrate um, <laughs> from some of the big presses. Yeah. Um. It's hard for you know. It's hard for me to even think about how you might do this, but because um, yeah. it's so local for us. I mean, I literally could walk to the the cider farm and point to the apples I want to have pressed, and uh, these guys can make that happen for us. Well, until Mississippi gets his cider press finished, uh, so I can truck on down there and pick me up some. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but see, even after I get my cider ma- uh, press made, I'm still relegated to using uh, store bought apples uh, because <laughs> here in Mississippi we have blueberries and cornbread. No apples, and that's pretty much <laughs> it. So, uh, well, then you're you know, going to have to buy moonlight meadery. <laughs> Help us get yeah, into your state. We just got into Louisiana, so I know your listeners in Louisiana are going to be pretty happy, but. Um, you know, we're, we're working hard to, uh, to to bring our ciders and meads worldwide. So, the more yeah. you guys can ask for it local, the better we do. Yeah. Maybe you could well, trade I, I that. Can, maybe you could trade that rhubarb you have in the freezer, Chris, for some cider from Michael. Well, you know, I had uh, <laughs> I emailed Michael uh, back in the spring because I knew I was going to be growing that rhubarb. And I wanted to make uh, the strawberry rhubarb mead, and that has yet to be made, but the rhubarb is in the freezer. I I made a pretty good crop of it, Uh, but I did find out in the process of growing it that here in this growing zone in Mississippi, rhubarb is is, uh, uh, an annual, not a perennial, so you have to replant it every year. That sucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I can't uh, because of the answer. heat. Yeah, yeah because and, some, and you have to be real careful where you plant it because it won't it won't tolerate this hundred and ten degree sun beating yeah. down on it all day, and uh, and our our winters do not get cold enough to make it go dormant, so it dies off. And uh, good rhubarb so, comes from mature plants. That's darn sure. I think. Yeah. But, but you know, that it's not something – for some reason, people have this misconception that rhubarb is a southern thing, and it's not. Uh, <laughs> you never see rhubarb here anywhere, and I, and I haven't found anybody who has ever tasted it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely not a in southern northern. Thing. Yeah, most of the folks yeah. that I've ever tasted around the country have only heard it of it uh, from New Hampshire or the you know, northern part of the country. So. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of sweet going in, and then when you first bite down on it, you get that old pucker factor coming through. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm going to use that, and uh, you know, the I, I sent out an email to you guys uh, a while back asking your opinions on how to use it, and 
uh, I've actually thought about maybe using that as sort of the sour and bitter component in a cider or sizer. Um, and I'm still tossing that idea around because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of one of those, I like to balance the sweet and the tart, uh, in things. And I think that might give me an opportunity to do that. Um, I guess, uh, Michael, one of the things that our listeners always, and, and me included, uh, we always like to try to come away with with a recipe. Can we twist your arm into uh, giving us something that we can all use on a home scale? Yeah, well, I'm going to keep it easy for you. So pick your favorite beer and something you've made many times that you're really good at. Take 15 to 20% of the base malt out of that recipe and substitute that gravity with honey. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And so so something Ryan, to 20%. Yeah. Ryan, you're, recipe you ever made. Ryan, you're our newest member, so uh, get your pen and paper out. You're the note taker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Done. Well, gosh, Michael, uh, man, I feel like I could sit here for the next two hours and ask him questions about making mead, but uh, you've been a big help, and uh, we certainly appreciate you coming on the show with us. Can we uh, call you again in the future? And uh, we'll, I'll tell you what, I'll handle the call this time, and I'll give you a couple of weeks at least, huh? <laughs> Notice. Yeah, let's is. get back on again. <laughs> Well, you know what? This the whole thing about our show. It's just like I said. It's five guys. We're sitting around talking mead, uh, and for us, it's just you know making good mead at home. Trying to avoid, uh, trying to avoid the steps that uh, lead us into no return. Uh, you know, because honey, uh, and we're going to spend the last few minutes of the show talking about honey. It's quite an investment for some of us, and especially when you get into some of the more hard to find varietals uh you know that you can't find locally and so uh, you know to uh, you know to spend you know a couple hundred bucks on honey uh and have it go to waste uh that, that's a sizable investment for a home brewer to make uh you know and then and then have a huge mistake at, in the end so not that it's all about perfection for us but you know we're, we're trying to learn how to do it the right way so that the end result of something that tastes good that our friends and relatives like to drink and you know we can share with uh, with our friends so but uh any any remaining question guys anything else you want to ask michael oh. no i think thanks for being on this was a uh, wonderful to to get a lot of great insight from you and look forward to connecting with you uh, again in the future for even more. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Any Michael. Any of your listeners it. looking to buy uh, my cider or meads online can uh, take advantage of our store or ask for it locally. And if we're not in your state, send us the name of the distributor you'd like us to work with, and we'll try to make that happen. Yeah, J.D. Webb. My address is... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking for it uh, uh, because you, you're not in Mississippi, so I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm either going to have to get you on your website or or find uh, someone who ships here. So, uh, but the the beautiful uh, thing about the internet is that we weren't in Louisiana until a couple of weeks ago, and some uh, fans from Louisiana helped get a distributor to give us a call, and we're now in Louisiana, so we can make this happen. Very good. All right. awesome. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Look forward to talking to you again. All right. Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Wow. Michael Fairbrother from Moonlight Meadery. And, uh, man, if you've had any, I mean, he makes some awesome stuff. And uh, slowly it's starting to come back to me, Chris, that, that fling. Uh, I forgot to ask him if he still makes it or not, but it's that rhubarb, the strawberry rhubarb, and my God, it tasted like my grandmother's strawberry rhubarb pie. It was so good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he still but, makes it. That's one yeah. of his 
one of his bigger sellers. Oh God, it's wonderful! I think the Kurt the Kurt's apple pie is his biggest seller, and I think the yeah. fling is is right up there in the top three or four, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I got quite a few takeaways tonight, and uh, so much, I'm going to have to listen to the show a couple times again and take some more accurate notes. I mean, I was trying to write as fast as he was talking, and um, as you know, it almost sounds like we're on the right track with this Braggit thing. Uh, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, you know, um, definitely. Uh, I think that we all. Um, you know, we're all, we all went very heavy on the honey. Uh, I, I think everybody did. I mean, I, I went, you know, six pounds of, of malt syrup and six pounds of honey. So, I mean, I was at a 50, 50 and, and I think everybody else was around there. I think he gave, uh, some kind of some good advice on, uh, treating it like a beer. Um, yeah. you know, as we, when we talk about aeration and degassing and, and, uh, keeping it under airlock, um, for question for you guys, um, uh, Aaron and Jeff who have done some more braggots, have you got, how have you guys treated, um, like, you know, the, the aeration and degassing and nutrient schedule, um, and how has your stuff turned out well um from from my perspective i know i i basically took a lazy bands approach to it i um uh, well i i say lazy bands I, I took a less strenuous approach to it so um i didn't you know de-gas jeff, really as thoroughly jeff i'll tell you sorry to cut you off but you know ultra efficiency often looks like laziness to the untrained eye <laughs> 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 yeah. let me let me write that, down that old saying uh, I, I, I may be <laughs> I, I may look like I'm doing nothing but on the cellular level I'm really quite busy <laughs> yeah, don't bother me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a little uh, fearful um, I'm a little fearful guys because I recall on a couple of shows ago we were talking about that very thing and I think the majority of us, a majority of us, decided that we were, you know, because it's a mead style, we were going to treat it like a mead, and we were going to we aerate the crap that. out of it. Yeah, we, you know, I mean, and, I aerated the I, crap out of mine. So, well, I got lucky. I got lucky and got busy working and didn't. So oh, yeah. I thought I had ruined it. I thought I had ruined it by not doing it. Turns out. Uh, it worked in my favor, so I yeah. Mean. I you know I only aerated it for the first couple of days. Now I don't aerate with a stir. I do it with a uh, with a pump and a uh, and a stainless steel aeration uh, tip. Uh, and it you know it's in ten seconds and it's out. Uh, and I did that for three days uh, in a row early, right out right after pitching. Yes, I'm. I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Okay, I have not tasted it, and I, I, I didn't. I had. I didn't want to taste it until after I got the bourbon and the oak in, because I didn't want to have, you know, because it's not all together. I didn't want to taste something that I knew wasn't going to be anything even close to the final product. So that purposely, I did not taste mm-hmm. it. So. Uh, well, you might not want to go by that too much anyway, because yeah. I saw a video just the other day of a guy making a braggot, and uh, he tasted it um, after about two weeks in secondary, and he said it tasted foul. And then he did a update on his video like uh, three months later where he just loved it. So. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I would judge it too quickly because these things, uh, I, I still stick by my uh, my original statement, uh, my original belief that, that these things take a while to, to come around. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the Porter Boche Braggot that I did a while back and that like recently won second in, in uh, show um, at a local homebrew uh, competition for meats, um, absolutely undrinkable for the first I want to say seven, eight months I had it. 
what was really only drinkable about nine months in. So, yeah, no, these things take some time to kind of marry the flavors and just mellow out and just jive together nicely. So I'm going to put my uh, I'm going to put my braggart down on the uh, same shelf with my wines that I'm aging, that I'm bulk aging and just forget about it mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and, and just let not, it roll. And not to, to necessarily disagree, but one one thing I might suggest doing is trying some throughout the aging process, you know, try Try some yeah. early, you know, once it, if, if you are choosing to bottle condition it, you know, give it a, a couple of weeks in the bottle to build up that carbonation level and try a bottle and then wait another month or two months and try another bottle. Cause I, I definitely think that these things change with age. Um, and, and I just, I, I'm interested to hear other perspectives on, on what other people think is, is that occurs. Yeah. You so, know, I also Adam, thought. Oh, Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was going to say, you know, another reason that's a good idea is that that also gives you a sense of the progress of um, it, of how it ages and where you started from versus where you're ending up. Um, that that's a valuable thing to have as you, as you're putting together different brackets or more brackets or even just repeating this recipe. Um, kind of a, a giving yourself an idea of like where you're stopping on different points in that that uh, process to get to the finished product. You know, I was going to say, yeah. too, I also thought it was real interesting because we, we talked about this, what, a month ago, that he was saying that he had been a part of making some braggots that were were 100% of the fermentables were coming from honey, and they were essentially using yeah. the grains as adjuncts. Yeah, uh, wasn't that interesting? And I, yeah. I've, done, I've done two... Um, meads i guess i can call them braggots now that um you know that have great steeped grains in them but that all the fermentables come from honey um you know here and i had let jeff talk me into thinking those were methicolins <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think i mean i mean let's, let's point this to jeff here for a minute i mean he's a resident uh trained third world best mead judge as well that was from the third world. Uh, so if, if, if uh, I, I mean, I, I'm guessing that if we were to submit our braggot to competition, then it must be 50% of the fermentables must come from honey, correct? Well, that's the no? ideal. I mean, um, they, I thought I was like a steadfast rule or something. Generally, you know, my my line in the sand is if if it's not mostly honey, uh, then it's a beer that's flavored with honey. It's it's not a, a mead yeah. that's flavored with beer stuff. Uh, realistically, if you're going to submit it to a, 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 a BJCP competition, um, the th- there's no way for them to know. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it wasn't mostly honey. Um, and I, I think like like Michael Fairbrother was talking about earlier, you know, if it's faithful to the style. Um, that that probably counts for a lot when you're saying, hey, this is this is in the style of a, uh, a golden Belgian or you know what have you. Um, that that probably counts for a lot as well. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. No, generally well, when I'm putting these together, I I go for the more than fifty rule, but I don't think it's hard and fast. Yeah, I'm. You well, know, I went. Uh, I had six pounds of malt syrup and ten pounds of honey in mine, so I don't know what that comes out to on the calculator. I'll have to run it, but uh, I should be well within the limits of. Uh, I'm, I'm getting on over into a mead, uh, a beer flavored mead almost. Right. Yeah. That's real close to the proportions I used for mine too, Chris. I think. Uh, so the one I sent to JD was six pounds malt syrup and, and nine pounds honey. Mm-hmm. And actually, that's about what I did with the Saison. I think it was about 6.8 pounds of uh, the, the dry malt extract, um, about 10 pounds of honey. And I, I had two pounds of like uh, grains that I, I did a, a simple mash on. Um, but the, the overall ponderance of the fermentables were coming from honey. So... You know, and, and just one question for the group here. I, I am trying to recall what yeasts everyone used, but for those of you that, that used an ale yeast, how how did that work out for you? Like, were you able to 
have a, a, a good fermentation begin and everything like that. I used the well, O5. Uh, I used O5. It fermented at 66 degrees consistently. And uh, I just racked it yesterday. Uh, so it spent uh, from, I have my notebooks up on the shelf, I'm going to say 10 days or so, somewhere around 9 or 10 days. Uh, I mean, there was, there was zero activity in the airlock for a couple of days when I, you know, when I racked it yesterday. So, yeah. and Gene, uh, well, I changed my mind at the, at the last minute. I was going to use an Irish ale yeast. Yeah, and, right. Uh, and I and I ended up changing my mind at the last minute and pitched D forty seven because my gravity was so high. Uh, I was afraid uh, that, well, I was afraid that I couldn't bottle condition it, which is what I wanted to do with this uh, if I used the Irish ale yeast because I was going to be so close uh, to their tolerance that it wouldn't work. So. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I, I told you wrong. Uh, I didn't use 05. I used Nottingham uh, specifically because I knew Nottingham would take me to the higher gravity and be okay with mm-hmm. it. So, yeah, I, I used Nottingham. Sorry about that. And, J.D., I, and I'm sorry, did you say how much malt and how much honey you used and, and what your starting gravity was? My starting gravity, uh, my starting gravity was 1.111. If you recall okay. the the discussion that Patty Mackey, uh, we had a discussion. Uh, uh, I was communicating with Patty about this whole thing, and she suggested that the six pounds of honey that I intended to add to this uh, bourbon barrel braggot uh, recipe, which she is very familiar with would give me something around 1100 you know 1.100 well it came out to 1.111 so i mean she (laughs) was right on the money yeah so uh and i know nottingham yeast because i've used it before and it's a high it's got a high tolerance uh so i knew that nottingham it would you know the the amount of honey uh, at that gravity wasn't going to be a problem for the nottingham because i've used nottingham and ciders and got and gone way over that even up into the 30s and 40s uh with it and it started just fine and that and that's not even that's just a dry that's a dry sprinkle just sprinkle the yeast on top and put the lid on it let so, it go yeah and that's what i did with the braggot i just sprinkled the yeast on top i mean within 12 hours it, it was bubbling away so um but I mean, and that, that's so. That's my experience. So uh, you know, whatever the rest of you done. I used the uh, Cefal USO five, and you know, mine took off like a rocket. You know, and and stayed strong all the way through. I mean, again, you know, I according to um, you know Michael, I, I you know, I didn't do it the way that he would have done it with uh with with degassing it narrating it but um i was also concerned because of um making sure that that yeast would would go all the way uh in in taking care of the fermentable sugars and so um you know, I was able to coax it, you know, to a to a higher than its traditionally published um, alcohol tolerance. Um, but but I mean, I, I don't with that yeast. That sounds like it's pretty common with with temperature and nutrients uh, to yeah. be able to do that. I also fermented mine at uh, sixty six degrees um, and had no problems with it. And Aaron, cool. my gravity, uh, my final gravity was zero one zero. Zero one zero. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So thirteen percent, uh, just a shade over thirteen percent alcohol. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we had such good results with the ale yeasts, and you know, I, I think that's promising to me because that's yeah. I, I like mm-hmm. the idea of using a yeast like that that may give you more of that traditional beer flavor. From the yeast, even well, with the higher higher 
starting gravity. You know, for me, it was I, I kept having to go back to that braggart that you made. That that's my base. Okay, everything I know about braggarts came from that one bottle that you sent me. And so I'm remembering, I'm remembering what it tasted like. I'm remembering uh, the hops. I'm remembering the sweetness. I'm remembering everything about it. Okay, so that that was my starting base. And then, of course, the adjuncts that I'm adding are the oak cubes and the bourbon. Uh, so I'm looking for this. This, and I've been I've been drinking. Uh, I'm drinking tonight, and I know we didn't go over, but I'm drinking another Kentucky Ale product. But this is a bourbon barrel stout that they make. Not as sweet, uh, a little more hoppier, and, uh, you know, both of their products, the Kentucky uh, Bourbon Barrel Ale and the Stout, are both very enjoyable. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, and I'm... Well, I mean, I'm, the wife and I spent, I think I spent like 200 and some dollars on bourbon. <laughs> 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 trying to find, you know, I'm on this mission, guys, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to find the right bourbon, and I think I found it. I used Eagle Rare. Out of all the, the five different bourbons that we bought, Eagle Rare just stayed at the top. And uh, that's what I use: 16 ounces of, of, of Eagle Rare, four ounces of Oak Cube soaked for 24 hours in Eagle Rare. The liquid from that and the 16 ounces went in. So you're talking probably maybe 17 and a half ounces of whiskey. So, well, just as a note, my mine went uh, starting gravity was 11.16. Uh, it finished out at, at one and, uh, okay. I thought what was the, that was 6.3 pounds of, of malt extract, um, 10 pounds of honey. And then I had some steeping grains, uh, in there. But, um, what I found curious was, um, when I did the calculator, I came out with 65 IBUs of hops, uh, before the honey. And then when I added the honey in, it brought it down to 17.15 IBUs. Wow. So, um, now, that is, that going to, is that going to reduce the hop flavor, do you think? Yes, I think so, because, uh, well, it, it, it reduced the bitterness for sure, because uh, they came down from 65 to 17, and... And for a red Irish ale, the if you the style guidelines are seventeen to twenty eight IBUs, so I'm right on the low end of the IBUs after the honey addition. Okay. So I'm thinking that uh, when when Ken did this recipe, he must have really put some time into it to uh, to figure all this out so that it worked out uh, with the honey addition to be within the style. Yeah. So, I, I just have this suspicion that braggots, especially these, you know, things where you're talking 11, 11, starting gravity plus, I just think these are, are beverages that can really stand up to some pretty heavy hopping. Yeah, and I think they're they're also, uh, uh, like like Michael said, these, these are things that you can lay down for a while and forget about. Well, and you almost owe yourself the the uh the benefit of the doubt to hop them heavily if you're gonna do that just because the hop character will kind of age out with it too um so it, it, it might be a smart idea to hop a little heavy on the, the front end uh so that as it ages out you retain some of that character so okay so that that's another oh wow okay so uh that's something i need to consider too because i'm thinking you know, leaving mine in the carboy for maybe a year. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So here's here's a question I've got for you guys uh, that that do have experience brewing beer. Uh, so I see a lot of beer recipes and and uh, braggot recipes as well, where you see these hop additions at different times during the boil, uh, but 
but oftentimes you'll see the exact same type of hops added. Like, uh, well, for instance, Chinooks would be added at 60 minutes, but then they add more Chinooks at 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So what what are you gaining? What What's the purpose of adding the exact same thing at a different time uh, in the bowl? Once for, what, once what, for what, aroma. You Yeah, the hops have uh, a certain level of alpha acid, and the alpha acid is determines the potential of bittering that the hop has. Right. Uh, the longer or shorter that the hop is boiling um, determines the bittering potential that that hop is going to have. And then also um, at, at different, if you boil a hop for sixty minutes, you've killed all the aroma. I mean, there's, I mean, maybe, maybe you know, someone will disagree with me, but pretty much all the aroma is gone. If, that's if not everything all of, that I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I'm I'm just covering my bases there. But um, if you do it at, you know, twenty minutes or ten minutes or flame out, you know, you're you're retaining some of that aroma or your, or all of it. And so the the timing that you use when you layer the hops and what you know what sixty minutes forty minutes ten minutes flame out whatever your cadence is you are um, altering the amount of bitterness that you're going to put in the beer as well as the aromas that are going to come out from the hops. Okay, so it's more a function of of gaining aroma than. Because if you were just looking at bitterness alone, it would be easy enough just to figure out how much you needed to add at the beginning and just leave it at that. Dump so it it's really more about, it. yeah, it, it's really more about aroma than anything, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say both. I would say well, you're, yeah. you're, to layer the, you're, you're getting the aroma and the as well as the bitterness because if you boil something for twenty minutes. It's still going to bring in some bitterness, so it's it's it, it, there's some calculations. You know, you got almost a a two bar sliding scale there. You know, trying to figure out you know where can I balance that bitterness and the aroma. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Let's um. You know, we can keep on this topic all night long. I'm sure, but uh, one thing I forgot to mention at the top of the show: this is Jeff's anniversary, so we've got to pay special attention to that. Happy anniversary, <laughs> Jeff! Uh, <laughs> give Mrs. Yep. Shouse our very best. Um, okay. Let's spend the last five minutes here before we close it out. Uh, Ryan, I, th- I don't know who it was, Ryan or Jeff or somebody had sent around. Uh, uh, something about some honey, about uh, questioning. I think it was Ryan. Uh, you you had sent something out about what we're paying for honey, and uh, I know we've talked about this on previous shows a couple times. But uh, let me just start out the discussion very briefly, guys. Is there is there a limit to your expense on? I mean, how much are you willing to spend per pound of honey, or is the expense related to your final result, what you're looking for in the end? Anybody? You know, I, it depends I, on one. why I'm making the mead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If if I'm making it for me or to give away to alcoholic friends, then I don't worry too much about it. Um, if I'm making it for a competition or think that it might have potential for a competition, um, then I'm going to go with, you know, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make it the best it can be. So yeah. Yeah. that's my stance on it. Ryan? Yeah, yeah. You know, I I kind of um, feel a little bit similar um, in that, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm making – you know, mead for home consumption and, and, or potential, some, some friends or some gifts or something. Um, I can get good Minnesota wildflower honey, um, or even clover, you know, for three, four ish dollars a pound, you know, if I'm buying it in bulk. Um, and that sounds good. I mean, the only time where I'd spend, 
a lot more is if it were in in ex- a varietal, extremely rare varietal that I really wanted to try something with um, and uh, and try out. So I told you guys last week that uh, my brother gifted me some watermelon blossom honey, and and he paid a very hefty premium to get that. Um, now, with with that being said, you know, I, I probably couldn't afford to make a five-gallon batch of watermelon blossom honey, so a lot of times when I'm making those smaller batches, I'm I'm only right. doing, you know, one or one-gallon batches just to see how they turn out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The yeah. most I ever spent on honey was $17 a pound for macadamia oh nut honey. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was the most I ever spent. And uh, let's hear from our resident beekeeper. How are my, how are my, how are my grandchildren, Jeff? Well, <laughs> how are my bees doing? <laughs> you know, I, I'm down to one hive now. Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I, I had that. one that was with left on me. the The other hive seems to be doing okay. Um, I've I've been a little reticent to bother them just because there does seem to be like a late fall flow going on and. You know, just kind of want to leave them doing their thing, getting into winter. Um, but they've been they've been buzzing, and um, it's you know it, it's like a, a, an airport over there. They've been coming and going really quickly. Uh, every right. time I've kind of peeked in on them, so hopefully they are gonna gonna have plenty to eat for the winter, and uh, just kind of keep our fingers crossed and see what happens when they when they get into the uh, hibernation. Yeah. They're not hibernation, but overwintering. All right. And, uh, I mean, over the course of, uh, you know, sometime next year, you'll be able to realize, what, anywhere from 50, 60, 100 pounds, you think, out of it? or You know, I, I hear all kinds of different averages. You know, the, yeah. the big average that I hear is, and this is a pretty wide range, it's 40 to 100 pounds per hive. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on a lot of different factors, obviously. Um, yeah. What are you willing to spend for uh, honey? You know, it it depends on the factors. I mean, if I have a a, a particular recipe in mind, and I have a, a style or a, a varietal of honey that I uh, I I really want to pair with it, I could see myself paying a premium for it. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I I tend to go with what I have easy access to, and um, you know, what I have easy access to around here is wildflower honey, and uh, that's. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I tend to say, yeah, Kansas wildflower is Kansas wildflower. Uh, I'm I'm not going to pay eight from you when I I know a guy I can pay you know four or five from. Uh, yeah. And really, if I can get it for three, I'm a happy camper. Um, Aaron. Aaron, what's your limit? So this is an interesting question. I where I'm at, I have actually have a a really cool honey farm just 10 minutes from my front door that basically I can get several varietals of honey from them for between maybe three and and four dollars a pound depending on the the volume I'm I'm purchasing it at um there's another place here in in Milwaukee that offers a a pretty wide array of, of varietals as well and and I'll tell you I I did kind of find my limit with them in the past um, they had, oh gosh, what is that style, that type of honey, Tupelo honey, um, that was like $12 a pound. And I had my heart set on using that Tupelo <laughs> honey, but when I saw the price tag, I said, nope, I'm drawing the line there. $12 a pound <laughs> is just outrageous, not doing it. So um, yeah. somewhere between yeah. probably 8 to, to 12, <laughs> that's where I draw the line. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard people talk about how great the Tupelo honey mead is and i've not found that to be the case uh i think tupelo for me anyway is a blending honey uh it does make an excellent mead but i i much prefer it blended with something rather than just a straight uh 100 percent tupelo like mesquite Uh, mesquite is that way yeah yeah and there's a lot of honey there's actually very few honeys that i'm aware of for my particular taste that I consider a standalone honey. Um, Orange Blossom is a standalone. Um, 
sour wood is a standalone oh yeah uh there's there's a couple you know but there's just there's very few that that i really like by themselves now uh you know we're talking about the price of honey here uh the that's the good thing about making things other than traditionals is that uh Especially if you're going heavy on fruit or heavy on spices or something, you have a lot more latitude in the honey that you can use. You know, yeah. a good a good strong cherry melomel with a lot of fruit in it, you can get away with using orange blossom. You can get away with using wildflower or, uh, you know, I mean, you could even go to, to a good quality clover honey and still come out with a really good uh, drink so uh, your your flavors that you're adding in will give you more latitude in some cases. Uh, now in the in the case of this, uh, you know, I, I told you about this banana nut bread mead that I was making. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I just uh, for some reason the flavor of the black locust honey uh, just that was what was in my mind that it needed. So I spent the money to get that because I just felt like that it was going to be worth it. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, you know, so when you start getting into something that you can just, you, you just know it needs that quality in it. I think it's worth spending the extra, but, um, uh, if you're just making a general batch that you're going to give away to friends and it's going to be gone and, a couple of weeks and it's nothing, you know, it's just not going to be anything special. I don't think you really need to go spend excessive amounts of money to get specialty honeys for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now somebody out there listening is going to be shaking their head going, I can't believe he would say something like that. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, really, well, it's just, uh, I, I don't see the point. You're not entering it in a competition, and you're not uh, you're not serving it to mead and wine enthusiasts. You're you're giving it to people who are who, who just like they like a good cherry melomel, or they like it's, a good. Just coming, you know, just coming from a guy, just coming from a guy where the town of Corinth stood out on the sidewalk. Cheering Chris as he comes rolling down the street with a brand new twelve dollar brewing bucket. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, it actually it actually went past that. Uh, <laughs> we were we were out for a drive uh, this past weekend, and I actually found this little uh, homebrew supply shop that I didn't even know was there. It was stuck back in the corner. Lucky find and. And I got in there, and uh, I came out much lighter in the wallet. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to I do, did, isn't it? <laughs> I did. A, I did a whole lot worse than twelve bucks. I can tell you that. Uh, but yeah. I did come away with some stuff, and, uh, and I'm glad I found the place because uh, all of these uh, braggots we've been talking about and uh, different beer styles and stuff. I got in there, and I found out this guy's got a, an entire wall full of different kinds of grains and he has a yeah. grain mill and and he'll measure it out down to a half an ounce if you want it and grind it up for you and yeah. and so I came out with enough stuff to uh, to brew up several different styles and god I, I got lactose and I got dextrose and I got yeah. uh, all uh-huh. sorts of jars of I got I don't even remember how many dozen it's, jars of different malt extracts I got and that sounds uh, that sounds like me uh, when I uh, my first trip to the you know getting involved in all this I went to the local brew store and a guy asked me he says that kind of help you and I said well I'm, you know I'm, I'm a mead brewer I'm gonna brew some mead and he says well you know what can I help you with I said well I need everything I just gave him my credit card and I said load me up all he saw was mm-hmm. dollar signs. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, this guy, <laughs> this guy had stars in his eyes. He had yeah. dollar signs in his eyes when I was in there because I started putting stuff up on the counter because I couldn't carry it around. And uh, he goes, let me just go back here and get some boxes. And so he brought out big cardboard boxes. And 
I come out with like 120 pounds of liquid malt extract of all different <laughs> kinds. And, yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, you but, but I, I was like, you know, I don't want to have to come back. Let's just get it all at once. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so I, here I'm sitting, and I don't even like beer, and I'm I've got like a hundred and something pounds yeah. of malt extract. So uh, now I got to figure out something to do with all that. So I guess I'm going to be making some braggots. All right. Well, uh, hey, we need to wrap this up so we can get Jeff out of here.